Thanks, everybody, for coming out. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. My name is Ash Whitener. Can everyone hear me back in the back? Elliot, we good to go here? All right. So a lot of you may know me on Facebook as Ash Oro, but my real name is Ash Whitener. Um, and I want to have a conversation with you guys today uh, about entrepreneurship. And for me personally, how it, I have found entrepreneurship to bring the most personal freedom in my life of everything else. And I'll get into why that is. But so the name of this presentation, or I don't even like calling it a presentation, the name of this conversation is Anarchy 3.0, Building Freedom Through Entrepreneurship. And I've tried to build freedom in my own life for a very long time, unsuccessfully in a lot of areas. And we're going to go through some of that today. Um, if you've got questions and stuff, you know, I'll be glad to do, uh, answer them all at the end. I've got nine slides, so we're going we're gonna to bust right through them. But um, before I get started, now let, me, let me bring up these slides here. If I were to ask you, or if you were to ask somebody, and don't answer this yet, but if you were to ask somebody what, a, what an anarchist is, you know, start thinking about what, how they would describe you, okay? So who am I? Well, I'm, I'm Ash Whitener. I'm first and foremost an anarchist, a voluntarist, an entrepreneur, a lover of indiv individual liberties. I'm currently the head of business development at Euro Pacific Bank. I've got one of my esteemed colleagues, Mark Abella, here in the front row, who I've had the pleasure of working two years with and just met him. We've been a virtual team up until, you know, yesterday, which is really awesome. So thank you, Mark, for coming all the way from Japan. Thank you. I'm also the host of the Liberty Entrepreneurs podcast, where it's my platform to try to get the idea of entrepreneurship and individual liberty out into the world. And I recently founded a company called Liberty Virtual Assistance, where I help digital entrepreneurs hire staff from the Philippines to help them with some of their daily tasks, answering emails, managing their social media, doing data entry, setting up their CRM systems, or building websites, stuff that as an entrepreneur, we don't have time to do because we need to work on our business rather than in our business. So again, think about that question about what is an anarchist? What is an anarchist? To 95% of the public, just shout it out. What's something that describes an anarchist? Freedom. What? Molotov cocktails. Black coveralls. That's right. What else? Flipping over cop cars. Right? Throw what was that? No, I don't, I don't think that people on the street think anarchists are voluntary interactions. I, I don't think that we've won that definition. You know, what they, th what they see us as is this. Like it or not, that is an anarchist. That right there is an anarchist to 95 or more percent of the people in the world. So we have a perception problem. We have an identity crisis. Jumping on police cars or ambulances and people just loving this guy. This guy's a hero up here. He is an anarchist to most of the world, right? To most of the world. Well, that's not us. So this is what I've considered Anarchy 1.0. So that begs the question. The title of this presentation is Anarchy 3.0. What is Anarchy 2.0? Philip, voluntary interactions. What else? Who are we? Are we that guy right there? We're the non-aggression principle. We extend property rights to children, right? We don't use the force. We understand taxation is theft. We got our colors. You know, you see it up at the top, non-aggression principle. And look how civilized this guy is. He's just floating out in space doing his thing. We know that good ideas do not require force. Right? This, this is who we are. This is the new anarchy. This is what we represent. This is why we come together. So look at somebody beside you. Th thank you for evolving with me. Right? Thank you. Yeah, seriously, look at somebody and say thank you for being peaceful. This is an amazing congregation of people. So uh, now that begs another question. What is Anarchy 3.0? And this is what my presentation is about. Anarchy 3.0, this is a quote from Buckminster Fuller that I really like. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. 
And uh, Luis Fernando Mises said it really well the other day. He said, you don't just go poking a bear over and over and over, right? Especially when you, you're not going to win that fight. So just like what Bitcoin's doing, we're building a new system to transcend the old forced-based totalitarian system, and that's what we're doing. So this, this conversation is just from my experience, and this is just my experience. You may be able to relate. If you relate to what I'm saying, you know, give me a rabble rabble. Raise your hand, clap, do something. Let me know that we're connecting. Thank you. So, my journey to freedom started in 2007, and a buddy of mine at work sent me a movie called Freedom to Fascism. Anybody heard about that movie? Right, and I went home and I watched this movie. Poof. I'd never heard of this stuff before. I'd never been exposed to this stuff before. I came back the next day, and he was like, hey, Ash, did you watch that movie? It's actually this guy right here, Mike. I worked with him for seven years, and he said, you watched that movie? And I was like, uh, yep. He said, what'd you think? I was like, well, apparently Neo was right and a rabbit hole exists. And he was like, do you remember a guy named Ron Paul in the movie? And I was like, yeah, that was like the old kind of cranky guy talking about an economic collapse. He's like, what if I told you that Ron Paul is running for president? And I was like, holy shit, how deep did this rabbit hole go? And so he starts sending me Ron Paul videos, and, you know, this is 2007. I'd, I'd been completely apolitical up to that point. I, I didn't pay attention to politics. You know, my, I think my lowest point was in 2001 or two, whenever I was an engineering undergrad at North Carolina State University, and I said the words, I can remember, haunts me till this day, I hope we go to war because I want a strong economy when I graduate college. That's true. And so here I am starting to listen to Ron Paul, and I found myself, some may have called it obsessed, because I was waking up every morning, and I didn't go straight to a shit shower shave. I went right to my computer to listen to the latest Ron Paul interview, right? This was the first adult that it was, I thought ever told me the truth. And so I, I was hooked. I was hooked. And I wanted to figure out, this is my learning freedom. This is when I started building the theories and understanding of freedom that I needed to set me free. You know, I was, I was there. I, I, I marched on Washington at the Revolution March, right? I helped, I, helped, I helped fund the blimp, the Ron Paul blimp that launched out of North Carolina, right? I, I went to all of Ron Paul's rallies. I was there. I was dug in. I was committed. I mean, the Ron Paul Corvette? Who remembers that shit, right? That's crazy. Introduced the gold and silver. You know, eventually I learned what anarchy was. And Lou Rockwell was the first anarchist that I ever knew of. And then Jeffrey Tucker was the first happy anarchist that I ever knew of, right? And so I started learning about this stuff. And then the crash happened. You know, that wasn't very long after Ron Paul's presidential campaign ended. The big crash happened. And I lost 50% of my 401k. And I, I'm not a rich guy, but I had like... You know, I had like fifty thousand dollars in my four one k, and it dropped to like twenty or twenty five, and I was like, "Holy shit!" I just got burned, and all the guys I listened to were always talking about this crash that's about to happen. So I was like, I didn't have Ron Paul anymore to listen to every morning, so I retooled my morning routine, and I was like, I have to learn economics because this is not going to happen to me again. I will not be fleeced by the market, by the stock market, without at least having an understanding of what's going on. And so I was like, I'm going to learn economics. So who, just shout it out, who was Ron Paul's economic advisor in the 07, 08 presidential campaign? Peter Schiff, that's exactly right. So I started listening to Peter Schiff every Wednesday, and then all of a sudden he had a daily radio show. This was the best thing ever. And so what happened was I started learning about gold and silver and what fiat money is and, like, you know, why this stuff is important to a free society. And then, you know, I, had a, I still had a pain, though. I still had a pain. The pain was that I lost money, and I needed to act. I needed to do something for myself so that I didn't get fleeced again. So I started reading. I started learning. And one day on Peter Schiff's radio show, he said, you know, he's ranting about the banks and, you know, what he does all the time. And he said, I'm going to build an offshore bank because the U.S. government has made it so burdensome for me to service my international clients that I just can't do them in the States anymore. And so he's, he was like, 
I'm going to build an offshore brokerage company, and I'm going to have a bank that facilitates the wire so I can actually service my international clients now. Like, screw the U.S. government. I'm going to get out, and I'm going to open up an offshore bank. Send me your resume. I, I was an engineer. I was a programmer. I didn't have any financial experience. And so I sent my resume. Just, why not, right? I, I, I had a pain. I wanted to continue to learn, and why not learn from one of the best, right? And so I get a call back about, you know, a month later or so. They're like, hey, Peter wants you to come down and meet him at, uh, this, is, this is in 2012, so another four years. So I've been listening to Peter for four years, right? Peter wants you to come down and interview with him in Charleston. He was covering the Republican uh, presidential debate. And so I drove down there uh, with my brother, and we interviewed, and he took a look at my resume, and he was like, there's, there's no way I could ever hire you. That's the first thing out of his mouth. And, and I, it felt like forever that he looked over my resume. It's probably like 30 seconds or so. He said, but if we do hire you, there's two things that I want you to remember. One is treat your Pacific bank as if it's your own business, right? As if it's your own business. Come into this thing and treat it as it's your own little small business. I don't know how you're going to make money. Maybe selling gold, selling mutual funds, opening brokerage accounts, selling gold back debit cards. I have no clue. But you're going to latch on to something if you treat it like your business. The second thing is stop listening to me today. Right? Peter Schiff told me in the interview, do, if you get hired, do not listen to me anymore. And I was like, why? He said, because if I hire you, that means you've got enough theory to do what you need to do. You need to go down there and build. That's what I did. I packed my shit. I quit my job. I sold all of my stuff, and I said goodbye to my friends and family in, in North Carolina, and I moved down here to St. Vincent, where the bank is. That's a picture of the bank. That's a picture of the neighborhood I lived in. And I was building now. I wasn't, I wasn't learning anymore. I didn't need to learn any more theory. It was time for me to put my theory in action. And I think that's the big difference between, you know, me and a lot of other people in this community is that I see a pain that I have, and I'm going to build something around it because I'm the most important person in the world as far as I'm concerned, just like you're the most important person in the world in your own perspective. And if you're not happy and you're not free, how can you teach other people to be happy and free? So no longer did I worry about auditing the Fed. I worried about listening to my clients. And I worried about trying to create a conversation with curiosity to solve a problem that they needed, right? Well, at first I didn't do that. I was pushing gold on people. Oh, Peter Schiff, I've been studying gold forever. I know, the, I know the reasons to have international stocks, all this stuff. And nobody was buying my stuff. And I, I moved for commission only, right? I quit an $80,000 engineering job to move down to St. Vincent on my own savings for a commission only position to work with Peter. Nobody was buying my stuff. Nobody was buying Peter's investment products. So what I had to do, remember, we were going to form a brokerage account with a bank on the back end to facilitate the trades for our clients. That wasn't what they wanted. That wasn't what the market wanted. So after about six months of making nothing, six months, I only had six months more of savings, I, I told the president of the bank, I was like, you know, Mark, we've got, to, we've got to change our approach here. People want an offshore bank. They don't want an offshore brokerage. They want an offshore bank that doesn't loan their money. They want an offshore bank that has high-quality customer service, right? They want to be able to get in touch with somebody when they have a question about their wires. This was what the market was telling me that they wanted. I was trying to push gold and international investments on people who didn't want it. And I think this is pretty common in our, in our group here. You know, it's like, if you just listen to me about the Fed, if you just listen to me that taxation is theft, if you would just listen to me, you will be free. Wouldn't that be nice? And I had to learn that because I had a pain that I wasn't making any money, right? Here I had a decade of, of engineering experience. I moved into another sector and I was trying to push my ideas onto other people rather than listening to what these people actually wanted and what pains I could actually solve for them. So it started, it really got me thinking. And I, I then moved to Panama where I'm a permanent resident. Um, 
and then that's the and of course there's a pain right the the pain of living in St. Vincent was that it had nothing to do with my culture I didn't fit in I was so obvious you know there wasn't a good market there there were no Walmarts or anything and you know Amazon couldn't reach there so I had a pain so again I put more action into place to solve that pain I moved to Panama and I became really reflective after about two years in Panama this is probably 2014 and I was like I was sitting there and I was like what was it that has created this freedom in my life like what has actually created personal freedom in my life I can't make you guys free right yeah we can talk about stuff we, we can theorize all day but if I'm not free I can't make you guys free so I started thinking back I was like what was it was it was it Ron Paul was it funding that blimp was it marching and getting angry and making more Ron Paul 2008 signs than you can ever imagine you know was it donating to these campaigns was it what was it was it commenting like a troll on every Ron Paul video to anybody that said a negative thing about him right none of that had made me free what was it it was entrepreneurship it was that advice that Peter Schiff told me in the interview and it stuck with me all these years build build get your theory so that you can put it into action because theory in and of itself isn't worth that much guess what all of you guys are going to die one day and if you're all this amazing understanding of the non-aggression principle dies with you what a tragedy peter told me to build and building's what i did and so it got to the point where i really had to redefine freedom because of all the things that i thought were going to make me free didn't make me free didn't matter how many gold stocks I had or how I could argue from first principles. It didn't matter how I could tell people that, you know, Thomas Jefferson wanted a limited government and this and this and we've strayed from that. It didn't matter. It was all out of my control. The beautiful thing about entrepreneurship is you are in your own driver's seat. You get to spend your time how you want you network with the people you want you spend your capital and invest your capital how you think it's most productive for you you are solving your own pains by solving other people's pains isn't that the beauty of the market I mean don't we all know this haven't we read the books I mean look it, Mises calls it human action not human thinking right it's not human complaining so it re thank you So here I am, I'm at Playa Vanal in Panama, you know, really reflecting on the next stage of my life. I'm debating on moving back to the States and, you know, I was laying in bed at a hostel on Playa Vanal thinking like this, like what has created freedom in my life? And this little crab, this little guy right here, would not leave me alone, crawled up in my bed and he kept pinching me all night long, all night long. And I was like, oh, you know, it's, it's easy to be annoyed with this. But, you know, as an entrepreneur, I see obstacles as opportunities. And while this little crab was pinching me, I was like, okay, well, he obviously doesn't want me to go to sleep. I'm just going to sit here and think about things and be reflective. But it seemed to parallel my previous fight because I could have crushed that crab in a heartbeat. He had no chance, zero chance against me. I could have smashed him, right? He was picking a fight with somebody he shouldn't have been picking with. But it paralleled with me picking a fight with the government. Me picking a fight with the Fed. Right? Am I going to fight for my freedom? Fight against something that's so much bigger than me, just like that crab was fighting against me who's so much bigger than him? Or am I going to try to build and create and solve problems and pains in society? And so I came to that night with an epiphany of the term liberty entrepreneurs. I was like, that's it. That's what has created all this, this liberty and freedom for me. It was entrepreneurship. And I was like, I wonder if anyone else is like thinking this way. You know, I'd watch more Mises Institute videos than probably humanly possible. I don't know how many times I heard Jeff Riggenbach, right? Bob Murphy, Tom Woods, I, the, the whole sh gang, right? The whole gang. It was entrepreneurship, liberty entrepreneurship, liberty entrepreneurs. I was like, I. I've got, I was obsessed again. I was like, I have to go out and see who else is talking about this stuff. 
I couldn't handle it that the Mises Institute would only talk about the market, the market, the market, the market. The market solves our problems. The market's this win-win. There's market forces. But who's the market? The market doesn't solve any problems. You and me as entrepreneurs, we solve these problems. And if we're not acting, then the market can't solve problems because the, the engineers of the marketplace or the entrepreneurs aren't there making the solutions offering the products and services so that all of us live more comfortably. Liberty entrepreneurs had to get this conversation. I had to start finding other people that under, like, had this perspective, and a lot of people didn't. Because a lot, for some reason, a lot in our community are not entrepreneurs yet, yet. So now it was time for me to really start building freedom because I had the experience of fighting. I had the experience of moving and giving up and putting myself in a really uncomfortable situation by moving out of the States into you know, one of the poorest countries in the Caribbean. I had the experience. I heard Peter in my ear, build, build, build. And so I decided it was time. This is a picture, the background's Panama. So this is at Anarchapulco last year, actually. This was whenever I uh, interviewed Roger Veer, talking about this, really still trying to get this idea out. I had a pain. I personally had a pain. I wasn't getting the conversation that I wanted, right? So I built a platform so that I could go worldwide and try to find people and have a reason to talk to these people. I've interviewed Patrick Byrne, Andreas Antonopoulos, right? Trace Mayer, all these people that think like this, but how was I ever going to get in touch with these people and have them even reply to me? Why, why would Patrick Byrne, the CEO of Overstock.com, want to talk to me? Well, all of a sudden, I got a podcast, <laughs> right? Called Liberty Entrepreneurs, something that he connects with. And so I started building. I went to this conference called the Rhodium Weekend Conference, and it's just for digital entrepreneurs. And I, I was probably the, the least successful person at the conference. Everyone here is passively cash flowing at least $10,000. It's an invite only, like big mastermind of 100 people. And the reason I bring this up is I came away with two, just like Peter told me two things that I really remembered. This conference told me two things. One is always speak from experience. Because if you're speaking from experience and somebody else disagrees with you, it's just your experience. You're just speaking. You can't be wrong because you're speaking from your own experience, right? And the second thing that I walked away with is lead with value. And we all know that the market creates value, but lead with value. Don't go in asking, how, how can you help me? Extend value first. How can I help you? Ask Mike, right? Ask Mike Nimitz. He knows. Lead with value, because if you're leading with value, then people are going to see you as somebody that has answers, and if they don't have answers, they're going to try to figure it out to help you. Imagine that. Imagine if we were known as the community that was always trying to solve problems instead of just pointing them out. And so I saw a problem. While interviewing all of these awesome entrepreneurs on my podcast, there was one thing that kept coming back, and it was, I need to hire and extend my business. I need, I need to expand my business. But I, I, I'm a startup. I don't have, cool, perfect. I, I don't have the resources to hire somebody in the States for $20 an hour and buy them Obamacare and pay all the taxes and do all this stuff. But I don't, I've, I've never really worked with a virtual team. Well, you know, Mark Gabella can tell you, we've been working virtually for years and years. I've been working at the bank for five years now. I've never met almost anyone on my team. So I had value that I thought I could offer the people that I was interviewing. I could help them find virtual staff around the world, start giving them some tips on how I manage a virtual team, how I organize myself, and how I effectively communicate with a virtual team. This was value. This was knowledge and experience that I had that I could give back into society. I could solve pains because of my experience and my knowledge. The knowledge alone wouldn't do it, folks. The knowledge alone's not gonna do it. So I built this business. 
only because I had people constantly coming up to me asking, like, where can I find a virtual assistant? How can I hire a virtual assistant? Can you help me hire a virtual assistant? That's when you know you've got a good business model, right? Because when people are asking you to do stuff for them, that is a direct pain. That is, that is that market feedback, right? That's the loop. And so I built Liberty Virtual Assistant. This is my team. Well, actually, that's Mike's. That's Mike's virtual assistant, isn't it, Mike? That's Sarah. Dexter. Ted's, Cherry, they, they all help me build. And I, p I pay them like, you know, five bucks an hour. Oh, <gasps> five bucks an hour. I get criticized all the time by people. I mean, capitalist. Somebody asked me the other day, don't you want to pay them $15 an hour? No, I want to pay them $0 an hour. <laughs> they all worked in the call center industry. You know, listen, listen to the podcast, episode two. Dexter used to have to ride two buses to go to work. It took him three hours. He would work a nine-hour shift. Then he would ride two buses back, and he would get paid the same that I pay him to work four hours from the comfort of his own house. All right? Thank you. You know, imagine if we were the people that were creating these opportunities Dexter doesn't know about the non-aggression principle. He doesn't know about the Federal Reserve. He doesn't know about the, the Depression of 1920, which statistically and was deeper than the De Great Depression, but we didn't have the Federal Reserve, and we were still on the gold standard, so they didn't do anything, and we got up, and uh, who cares? Who cares? Is it relatable? You know, Sterling was talking the other day, yesterday, about relational anarchy. I can guarantee you that Dexter is starting to figure out what anarchy is without me even having to tell him. Because he, he listens. We have a relationship. So where do we go from here? Got to build freedom. We got to build freedom. It's not enough just to point out the pains and the boot on your throat anymore. We're Anarchy 2.0 right now. We are the smartest people, the most consistent people that we know. You all know this. You're bored with everyone else's conversation if they're not an anarchist. I know that you are. I am. That's why I built a podcast. To solve my own problems, I had to solve other people's problems. I moved to the Caribbean and thought that I was going to save the world by offering them a gold back bank, a, a Rothbardian bank, a 100% reserve bank. I was going to be the difference. I was going to save the world. And I might just audit the Fed while I'm at it, right? No. Remember, the market doesn't solve problems. Entrepreneurs do. We do. We solve people's problems. So listen and be curious with people. You know, I love that there's a theme of relational anarchy happening right now because that is it. It doesn't make, you know, it makes so much sense. It's a relationship. You and I, we're understanding, we're being curious. See what other people find value, valuable and present your value to them in that way because maybe they don't want to buy your gold. Maybe they just want to have a conversation with you. How can you build that foundation? How can you listen to them and actually provide value that's going to connect? That's what I had to learn at the bank. I thought it was never a bad time to buy gold. Well, guess what? People didn't care. They thought it was a never good time to buy gold. Embrace and leverage the market forces that we all hear about all the time. I don't know how many podcasts I've listened to or Mises Institute videos I've listened to and they, the, con the blogs that I read and everybody talks about the beauty of the market. We don't talk about how to build it. Apply market forces to the state. Make these guys compete. So what if they have the gun in the room? Cry. Who cares? Cry about it. They have a gun in the room. They have that advantage. But guess what? We have market forces. We have creativity. We've got competition. We get to network. And now we have our own money with Bitcoin. The world is becoming more and more decentralized. And the powers that be can't stand it. Make them compete against us. Offer and create goods and services that are so well thought out. Your systems and your processes and your customer support are so good 
that even if it's a little bit more expensive, maybe clients will start coming to you instead of depending on the state because they're not going to get treated well at the state. There is, there is value that you can create to apply these market forces of creativity and competition to the state. Because ultimately, if we're going around and we're solving people's problems and we're creating value and we're creating win-win scenarios, right, we are going to be able to build a world that transcends the state. And that, for me, is freedom, right? So what can you do? I don't know. Start asking people. Start being curious. Whatever you think your skill is, try to apply that. Because ultimately, becoming a liberty entrepreneur is going to be how we build freedom for each other and for ourselves. Thank you.